In this short screen capture, we're going to be looking at water column dynamics uh, from a model. So this is the will be the output of the General Ocean Turbulence Model, or GOTM, um, which provides turbulence modeling um, for a number of ocean models. This is a simulation of the water column at Ocean Weather Station Papa. It's one of their standard validation test cases. It's just uh, here we're looking at one year simulation. Uh, OWS Papa's somewhere in the North Pacific. It's maybe uh, off the coast of Washington at about 50 degrees north. The water there is 250 meters deep and that's going to be the y-axis and most of these uh, images here. And what you're seeing here is, for example, the density variation in the water column over the course of this year, which happened to be 1962 over the course of this year um, in days on the x-axis. All four of these charts have the same x-axis and the z-axis is, is uh, the z-coordinate or the uh, y-axis is the z-coordinate in meters. So you see here we start off with um, the initial conditions and s at the onset of summer uh, where we have weaker winds and net positive heat flux you start to see um, the density decrease and you see this reflected in the temperature field. At this site salinity only weakly modifies density. It strongly just reflects temperature except below this layer. So the density, the salinity increases when you get below about a hundred meters and it stays that way consistently all year. So this change in density is ref a reflection of the salinity but in the upper hundred meters it's pretty much a reflection of the temperature fields. Um, so let me start with the forcing. It's forced by winds and heat flux, and the model does assimilate data in order to constrain it, but I won't talk about that. Uh, this is the wind stress in pascals. Uh, peaks out a bit above one or one and a half pascal uh, over the year, and you can see in the, in the springtime here, the first quarter of the year, and in the fall, or I guess this is winter and spring, and this is fall and winter, um, so in the first three months, Mar uh, January through March, and the last three months, October through December, you have the largest wind stresses from storms. And during summer, late spring to early fall, you have very weaker, relatively weaker wind stress. Um, that's typical of many regions where um, you don't have strong sea breezes. Heat flux a little more difficult to see because you have, um, it's oscillating on a very rapid time scale because there's zero short wave at night. But the key indications are if you try to take the sort of daily average mean of this curve, you'll see that it's net positive during the summer months in the middle here. It's net negative during spring, uh, late winter and spring, and early winter and fall. It is net negative. So it's positive heat flux in these months and negative heat flux in these months. And you can see when these storms happen, you have some very large uh, negative cooling events coinciding with these particular storms right here, uh, more than coinciding, happening at the same time. Um, this again is in watts per meter squared, our typical unit for uh, heat flux into the ocean, and it's positive in. It's a positive number, it's, it's uh, net heat is going into the ocean. And you see that reflection of both the temperature and salinity, as I mentioned, these are essentially a proxy uh, for each other. So the temperature starts off as a two-layer system. There's a lot of wind forcing, mixing it down to about 80 meters. And it is until about halfway through the simulation, or about month five, this is around June, uh, day 180, that we start to have, really see the water column start to stratify. And that mixed layer depth um, and, and the edge here of the, uh, the thermocline uh, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and then we start to go into this cooling period here where you have uh, these very strong negative heat flux events here overcoming the short wave uh, with latent heat fluxes associated with these strong wind events so these could also be it could be from sensible or latent heat um, I, I don't have the data for this but it's sensible or latent heat strong negative heat fluxes and you see that the stratification disappears very quickly. We have uh, heat is removed from the water and the wind stress uh, mixes the water column to fairly great depths. We see after an annual cycle we don't return to the original 
uh, conditions, and that's for two reasons. One is uh, this is this is a model which is not perfect in terms of the forcing, um, and we have uh, zero um, horizontal advection. It's a 1D model, and the um, the net heat flux is positive. It works out to about 20, 25 watts per meter squared. So in this particular annual cycle, we don't have closure of uh, the heat content, um, which is why we're left with warmer water at the end than we were in the beginning. So the energy is conserved. It just happens to be that we don't have a um, zero net uh, heat flux at the surface. You can see the reaction of the water column. There's these strong wind stresses where the wind stresses are in the spring, you see these events. This is the velocity, only the x velocity in meters per second in the water column. And we have, um, it's, you know, we have events up to 50 centimeters per second. Primarily the water column is fairly quiet in ten, uh, on the order of 10 centimeters per second, a typical of a, a deep ocean kind of velocity. And then as it becomes in the late fall, we have these strong storms, it approaches one meter per second velocities. You see the velocities extinguish show at depth. The wind stress can only reach so far into the water column. So down here, not much is going on. Up here at the surface is where all the activity is in terms of velocity. And in this velocity, associated with this velocity is a shear. If I take one day, and it's a little difficult to see, but as I descend to depth, I have currents on the order of meter per second. And here, they quickly go down to zero. So right around here is a pretty strong shear where in just a few meters I'm going from a meter per second to a half meters per second to near zero. So there's a strong shear here and associated with that strong shear is the production of turbulence. Now a proxy for the mixing that's a result of that turbulence in the water column is what we call the eddy viscosity and it has units of um, mixing at meter squared per second of uh, uh, kinematic rate and we have, and you see these strong events coinciding with the winds. The summer comes, we have stratification, which essentially extinguishes the mixing. So this stratification means we have very light, I should go over here, lighter waters on top of heavier waters. We have light forcing from the wind. So we don't have the creation a lot of a lot of velocity and the associated shear. And what shear we have ex is, gets extinguished here because it can't overcome um, the potential energy, it can't create enough energy to overcome this density difference right here and mix through um, the, the epicnocline. So it's extinguished, we don't have much very strong mixing, it is until we have enough cooling to decrease the density of the upper layers of the surface here and associated with that cooling is strong wind stress, so it's sort of a double effect that will lead to strong mixing again at the surface to try to recover the water column back towards essentially its initial wintertime condition. This is the typical mid-latitude seasonal cycle. We have fairly well mixed water in the winter, stratified water in the summer, and well mixed water in the winter. And associated with that is a, is a nutrient uh, replenishment cycle as well that can lead to high levels of primary production. Now I'll show this as a time history and as it goes on you'll see these quantities react, this black bar will move depending upon what day it is, these red dots will move depending upon what day it is, and we will see that the uh, these are profiles, so these are profiles at that exact time of the density, the eddy viscosity in meters squared per second, and sometimes it will go, it will exceed 0.05, it will go off the chart here, and this is the temperature distribution in the water column. Um, you can see it starts off almost completely well mixed or isothermal in the top 100 meters here. You'll see stratification set up and then you'll see stratification decay. So let me go ahead and start this. So we're proceeding on, we're getting into February now and you can we have some strong wind events. The temperature is going to start reacting as we're probably in May. And now we're getting into late May. And now we're approaching June. And you start to see the stratification form. The upper layers are warming. Not much happening down here at depth. Now we have strong stratification, weak eddy viscosity. Still very, this is the strongest stratification right now. The mix layer, the, the thermocline will drop down. It will mix in as we're putting more heat in. 
and it will decay quite rapidly. Now we're starting to hit the fall storms. We hit one storm, and now we're hitting another storm, and you can see the thermocline here erode. Our temperatures are dropping, and that wind energy is mixing the water column down, and it's approaching its original values. Let me stop because it just looped. Um, so that's just a typical simulation. I picked one year um, from this water column model. It's an open ocean simulation, but it's a good representation of mid-latitude. You could think about this being the, uh, the interior of the Gulf of Maine. This could be a Jordan Basin simulation, for example, except that the Gulf of Maine has a stronger salinity influence, but, but the ideas are quite, quite